So last week's message surrounded the idea of salvation. And this week's surrounds the idea of sacrifice. We are to open our hearts all the time, even during our own suffering. And this means making sacrifices. So this week, the scripture again comes from the same letter to the Corinthians in Corinth who were being lured away from Christianity who, and who were having doubts about Paul's leadership. Paul is worried about the church in Corinth. Earlier in the letter, Paul tells them to think back to what Jesus taught, to what Jesus was. Jesus was not about schmoozing with all the right people in society. Jesus had no home, no possessions. He lived going town to town, much like Paul did. Jesus taught people by example, not by being a charismatic leader, but by being a humble leader. Jesus modeled caring for the sick, giving to the poor, visiting and coming alongside those whose society had outcast. Jesus taught us to give our whole self not just our Sunday best. Now when we think of giving, most of us go automatically to the idea of tithing or making an offering. And this week when I saw what the scripture was, I felt like last week was open your heart and this week was open your wallet. And I was like, I don't want to do that, God. <laughs> don't make me preach about that. But that's really not what this is all about. And um, it's true that a church can't exist without funds to cover the necessities as well as funds to do the ministry. But we do not buy our salvation just as we do not earn it. Our salvation is something that happens after we've received God's forgiveness. The no strings attached gift. As we experience God's grace, we feel loved by God and want to give of ourselves. We want to be generous with what we have because we've realized that with God, we have everything. And that God is the one who has allowed us to own things in the first place. Whether that is owning possessions or money or owning our own time, owning our talents and skills, or even owning free will the right to choose. God gave us all of that. Sacrifice was not new to the Jews, nor was it new to the Romans. They were used to sacrificing taxes to their leaders. But in postmodern times, we typically don't want to make sacrifices. We're told, much like the Corinthians we're hearing from others, that we can have it all in the worldly sense, become wealthy and powerful in society. But it's not the perspective that Paul had about having it all. His perspective matched that of Jesus, having it all through a loving relationship with God and with others. It's not that Paul believed this would mean there would be no suffering, but that through our suffering, we'd still find the fruits of the Spirit, things like peace and love and joy. Sacrifice is a word that gets brought up when we talk about Jesus. We're told that Jesus was the living sacrifice. So why don't we embrace sacrifice? From a very young age, we must be taught to share. We're programmed to see things as mine and theirs rather than ours. Our self-preservation muscle is strong. And when the Corinthians gave gifts or sacrifices, they expected to be given something in return. So in the scripture for today, Paul says, for you know the generous acts of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. What was the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ. Is Paul talking about Jesus' crucifixion? Or is he speaking of Jesus giving his whole life in the mission of teaching humans 
how to love God and love their neighbors. I don't remember Jesus ever being rich in the worldly sense. He was rich in the heavenly sense because of his relationship with God. Jesus was rich. One may say that Jesus was very generous with his time, his treasures, and his talents. He could have stayed home and lived a very ordinary Jewish life. He had the opportunity to be a taker in life, but he chose to be a giver. He could have just looked at life as looking out for number one. He certainly had opportunities to be with the wealthy and the people who were touted as the holy men. If Jesus had been worried about not having enough, if Jesus had been an ordinary human, that could have happened. But Jesus didn't have a scarcity mentality. He wasn't worried that there wouldn't be enough to go around. Jesus knew that his father would provide for him as long as he was here living life on this earth. Jesus trusted that God would provide for all of his needs, not once, but his needs. What our Bible says is that he was concerned about others and he stayed connected to God. Jesus was a giver. Paul tried to model the way of Jesus. He taught others, including the Corinthians, about living in the way of Jesus, working not toward putting himself in a better position, a position of more comfort, less worries, more wealth, less scarcity. Jesus kept working to make sure others had enough, enough love, enough food, enough care, enough shelter. He didn't see life as having a limited amount of time, treasures, and talents. He used everything he had at his disposal in trying to help humanity learn that loving God and loving neighbors would lead to enough. Enough for all. Our church has been modeling with this community garden this concept. We certainly could grow food to feed those inside the walls of the church, but the idea was to serve others rather than ourselves. Of course, we don't want to waste God's gifts, and that's why whatever is left, we bring back and offer to our members. When Dave suggested this ministry, he explained that he always planted a garden at home, but it didn't always feel like it was worth all the effort. You guys kind of feel that sometimes too? Um, so he felt like if he was going to put all the effort in, he wanted it to be a gift to others. The sacrifice of the time he's willing to give is not tied to what he is getting. Dave sacrifices his gift of gardening, but Diane uses her flowers. When she gives this gift of time and talent, she doesn't expect anything in return from the people in our church, from the people that we serve in the community. She doesn't expect anything in return, and these are true sacrifices. A sacrifice isn't a payment or an investment. A sacrifice is the gift we make without strings attached. Paul goes on to remind the Corinthians that a year ago you all said you wanted to make sacrifices toward this mission. You wanted to support this mission. Now basically, finish what you started. Do what you said you're willing to do, what you desired to do. Now Paul mentions that the way in which something is given makes a difference. For if the eagerness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. If the eagerness is there, if the giver really wants to give and gives from the place of wanting to share, you all know the difference. Paul is saying that if the gift is given from the heart, 
that the gift given is judged not on the size of the gift, but that it was, it's given with eagerness and that it was proportional to what one kept for oneself. So it's less about what you're bringing to share and more about what you're hoarding at home and unwilling to give. But remember, just because people aren't giving in one area doesn't mean that they're not using their resources for something good somewhere else. If God has blessed us with extra resources, then God has also blessed us with the ability to choose how those resources are used. We may not see the whole picture. That's why it's not our place to judge what people do with their time and their money. You have free will. Free will to use your resources however you deem fit. What we give back to God is completely between us and God. Because God does know how we're stewarding our finances, our energy, our time, and our talents. And God knows what's in our heart when we do so. None of us know where others are making sacrifices. I know that Teresa sacrifices a great deal of time to care for someone outside of her own family. Dave sacrifices time to fix things around the church. Noel gets her early and stays late to do our video and sacrifices his pew time during worship. There are all types of sacrifices. Those we see and those we don't see. So when we read this scripture, we know that in the historical context of what was going on in Corinth, Paul was asking the Corinthians to stay true to their words, to their agreement to send funds back to Jerusalem. But in our context today, the scripture can be read as a reminder to continue to stay true to our commitment to our Christian vows to sacrifice our wants and desires to live in the way Jesus taught. In the next few lines, Paul says, I'm not trying to take all of the pressure off of your neighbors so that they completely ignore giving back to God. I'm just saying let's balance things out a bit. What you currently have and what others currently need. Let's balance this out so that it's a fair balance. Not let's all give the same amount, but let's not have some people sacrificing and others just coming along for the ride. That's what some of the people in Corinth were doing. So you may think that Paul is making some of this up as he goes. Maybe they thought Paul was trying to take control of things, take control of their money, but remember, Paul is only repeating the lessons of Jesus Christ. Jesus made it clear that a portion of what we have is to be given back to God with a thankful, joyful heart. And we don't need to just think of this in financial terms. It's easy to get really hung up on what we feel we lack. We lack a music program a children's program. We could go on, but God doesn't look at what we don't have. God is looking at what we are doing with what we do have. Why would God give us more to steward if we're not currently using the gifts that we have to the fullest? Think about what you have that God could use. What gifts do you have? Do you no longer work and have plenty of time to spend? Do you still work? but come in contact with lots of people every day who may be looking for hope? Do you have a knack for making people laugh, Lewis? Do you love to drive? Do you love to cook? Are you great with budgeting? Are you a great teacher or do you love visiting people? I could go on forever because there are so many gifts that God has given to humanity. And then we can widen that to include gifts that our church has as a group. We're good at making food and serving it. 
We make all people feel welcome. We have vibrant seniors and helpful youth. We all love God and care about God's church. And then there's those physical assets, a beautiful place to worship, a commercial kitchen, a big comfortable space for fellowship and meetings, high-speed internet and video capabilities. Again, these are just a few. When we begin to list all of the things that we have versus what we don't have, we see that we have an abundance already. We have people who are wise, creative, hardworking, and who want to grow their faith by loving God and loving others. People who are seeking to know more about Jesus, more about how Jesus' disciples gathered, so that we too can gather disciples and go be like Jesus in the world. And this next line refers back to what happened after Jesus ascended to heaven. Jesus' followers all came together and shared what they had, so everyone had enough. Enough love, enough for food and shelter. And this was referred back to from Acts. We can go back to the gospel and pull out the parables that Jesus taught about giving, but your tithing is between you and God. I don't need to stand up and remind you what your monetary gifts mean to this church, although I do that each week during our time of thankful giving because people still want to sac control their sacrifices. They want to be sure that their sacrifice is worth making to serve God in a way that they agree with. Some may be afraid to give out of a scarcity mentality, and certainly no one wants anyone to go without enough. That's the whole point. We want to be able to have enough to be able to help others have enough. We show what is most important to us by what we are willing to make sacrifices for. It shows our priorities. So Paul is asking the Corinthians to align their priorities with Jesus. Jesus loved God so much that he gave his whole life. Paul says, let's remember who and what we said was most important in our lives, and let's give with a sense of joy, not out of guilt or indebtedness, not even out of obedience. Let's look not at what we are offering, but what we are keeping for ourselves. How can we best use what God has given us with faith that we will still have enough and faith that God is going to take what we give and do something that we can't do alone? By asking us to give just a fraction of what we find to be the most valuable in life, we're experiencing what Jesus modeled. Sacrifice. Giving with an open, thankful heart is a spiritual practice, a weekly reminder that reinforces what is most important in this life. It isn't how much you give in comparison to someone else. It all boils down to trusting that in making God the most precious part of our lives, we already have enough. Let's pray. God of grace and mercy, we praise you for your no-strings-attached gift of salvation. We praise you for sending Jesus to show us the way, the way to live in harmony with one another while serving and loving you. Might we be reminded of the ways that we can do that, less out of obedience and more out of eagerness of spirit, with open hearts that desire to give our best selves to living in the ways of Jesus Christ the ways that fill us and others with peace, hope, and joy. Hear us now as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
here last week. You'll remember we did not have such a beautiful day. It was kind of a rainy day. And our message was about uh, salvation and how God gives us this free gift of salvation, but like a seed for beautiful flower. If you don't plant the seed, nothing is going to grow. So the plan was to give everyone seeds so that we could go out and plant our seed in our community garden just as we take Christ out to our community. So today, it is a beautiful day. So Dave and Cheryl have the seeds, and I'd like everyone to take the flower seeds out and nurture and grow them. We're here to help you. Cheryl and Dave can meet you out back if you're ready to drop off your seed in our garden. Go in the name of our Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.